Hi guys, Dr. Dillard here. Once again, let's do some more cardiovascular pathology, shall we? It is week three. This is Tuesday morning's kind of three-hour, part of the three-hour lecture. I already did the GIGU, the endocrinology lecture, and this will go through uh, the CVP now. Here we go. And we're starting out with pathology of the lymph system is where we left off. We talked about this a little bit in lab. But again, remember that the lymph system never kind of gets cheated out of all images. You see arteries and veins. They don't always put the lymph system in, but it is extensive. I mean, it goes everywhere arteries and veins go. And it's between, even the capillaries are between all lymph, all regular capillaries. There's a lymph capillary which remember it's blind, it's dead-ended, which is weird. They have a lot of valves too. Uh, so yeah, that's the lymph vessel. Remember its job, it's like a little vacuum cleaner here, sucking out the excess lymph fluid that's come out of the proximal capillary and wasn't able to be returned in the distal capillary. We talked about that. Diseases. Uh, so remember the lymph system, I think that's just everything I said, extremely important for draining the interstitial fluid. This prevents swelling when our capillary or when our little lymph, when our little vacuum cleaner is working, our little lymph system, our tissue is not going to swell and our cells of the tissue are going to be able to be serviced just fine. There's not, if you have too much interstitial fluid, remember it's hard to service the cells. Anything that blocks the flow of lymph fluid though, let's go back to this. What if we got what if we got ourselves a beaver dam? A little beavers built a dam right here. Let's say it's a cancer cell that's starting to grow into cancer. What's going to happen to this tissue? It's going to swell like crazy, right? All the, the fluid can't get in and the whole tissue is going to swell. And of course it'll be, I mean, maybe the whole ankle will swell up uh, because of this depending on where the beaver dam is. So that's a pretty simple concept. Okay, so that leads to upstream uh, swelling. If you know the problem is, sometimes you don't know if it's a lymph problem, so you just have to say swelling. That's kind of the catch-all term. But if they've had radiation therapy for cancer, uh, let's say in their inguinal region, and the, you know that the lymph nodes have been scarred up because of the radiation, then it's a lymphedema. You can call it lymphedema. Uh, let's see, when the cause is known, lymphedema, as I just said. Great, we did that one. Swelling causes ischemia. I just talked about that. But if the tissue swells, it's hard to service the cells, right? We we did a, we've went over that enough. I don't have to draw anything for that. Um, but yeah, it's hard to feed the service the tissue if you can't, if oxygen can't swim through all that gunk, all that interstitial fluid, and tissue can start to die and can become start to become painful. And this is especially problematic if some of the large lymph vessels get blocked because then like your whole lower extremity can swell because of something like that. Okay, it uh, usually affects one or more extremities are usually what's affected, uh, but it could happen in an organ as well, which you can't see. You can get lymph swelling in an organ. So there's two types of lymphedema we need to talk about, and two causes of, we have primary and secondary. Primary is pretty rare. So primary lymphedema or hereditary lymphedema, there's some subcategories, but we're not going to get into those. But the bottom line is the patient was born with a problem with the lymph system. Either the lumen of those lymph vessels was not large enough, and they just don't work very good. They're cheap vacuum cleaners, and the child swells downstream from wherever the, uh, the swelling is. And sometimes the valves are incompetent where they don't work right, and you can swell. The, the valves of the lymph system have to be working good or you'll back up fluid. Uh, and some people are born without lymph vessels. Maybe the whole lower extremity had no lymph vessels for them. Uh, so that's a huge problem. Their whole leg is going to swell. Devastating problem. Right? So, of course, the same th old thing. If you get a beaver dam, if you can't, if your tissue swells, uh, you get upstream uh, lymph swelling and the interstitium swells. And yeah, 
The primary lymphedema is fairly rare and so rare that we don't can't even the incidence is probably 0.001% or that's the prevalence. Uh, so it's really rare, much rarer than Marfan syndrome. There's only one condition I want to talk about, and that's the most common primary cause uh, called primary lymphedema. And this is something you're born with, and this is called Milroy's disease, almost like Gilroy, uh, Milroy's disease. Let's talk about it. It's caused by a gene mutation. We won't get into that. I think that's because that not. I mean, it's a pretty rare condition, uh, a gene mutation and it doesn't, these kids are born with abnormally narrow lymph vessels or even absent lymph vessels. And therefore, their interstitium is always swollen and they have trouble, they have trouble draining and yeah, big problem. Tissue can start to become ischemic. And it typically affects both lower extremities. Uh, they, if there's one problem, if with people, kids with Milroy's disease, they often have other problems. Almost a third of them, 37%, have hydrocele, they have swelling in the testicle and varicosities. One sign of a Milroy's kid is they have these weird up slanting toes, toenails, I mean. See how the nail plate is like spooned? It's like concave right here. Uh, so those are called, and they're quite swollen, right? Look how they're like little sausages. They're all swollen up. All right, so that's Milroy's disease. But let's get into the secondary causes of lymphedema. These are the ones you'll run into if you run into them at all. It's often called obstructive lymphedema. This occurs when a new blockage. So, so the kid is born with a normal nervous system, or normal lymphatic system, or the adult. And then they develop some type of beaver dam within one of the lymph vessels or more lymph vessels. And it usually affects the larger lymph vessels. And so anything upstream from the blockage is going to swell like a dam, like a beaver dam. It's going to swell like crazy. And that's called secondary lymphedema. What's the number one cause? Let's talk about the causes. By far, the number one cause is surgery, especially for breast cancer. But any type of cancer where the surgeon has to remove the lymph nodes and then try to reconnect the tubes, uh, you can get scar tissue and it can be unsuccessful connection of those tubes. And then how are you going to drain the excess lymph, uh, excess interstitial fluid away if you don't have a highway or vacuum cleaner to do it? And you can get really bad lymphedema from something like this. Number Another cause is in lymphangiitis, what we talked about in lab a little bit. We'll talk about it again in lecture. Uh, but yeah, if you get bacterial or viral infection inside of the endothelium of lymph vessels, you can get a swelling and it can narrow the lumen. The, the inflammation narrows the lumen to the point it doesn't work very good. And that can cause a beaver dam and cause a backup of interstitial fluid. Filariasis, not so much in our country, but other countries, we I think we talked about this before. Uh, we have worms that like to get in and they love lymph vessels for whatever reason. They clog up the pipes and uh, yeah, you can you get severe lymphedema from this. I think I showed you a picture. And as we said, chemotherapy after radi or radi and or radiation therapy, Chemotherapy stimulates fibroblasts, which lay down scar tissue inside the walls, inside the lumen of lymphatic system, and it can cause a beaver dam. And uh, pretty tough to, to deal with that and fix it. Neurofibromatosis 1, so that's the condition uh, where sometimes they get these, they're almost like cysts all over their body. I'll show you a picture. Sometimes they're inside the body as well. They don't show on the outside. And as the child grows, the cysts get bigger and they can they can clog up the pipes if they grow, if these tumors grow within lymph vessels, um, which they, they often do. Or even adjacent ones growing in the tissue can clog up the push on the lymph vessel and stop it from draining. So neurofibromatosis uh, 1, there's a picture of a more external type 
And yeah, if you ever watch the pimple popper, she can, she pops those things. They have like a little juice and fluid in them. That's a crazy show. I love it because I teach dermatology. So it's pretty cool to see how they treat some of the stuff I talk about. But that's neurofibromatosis one. Okay, here's a patient with a neurofibromatosis one, but they didn't really manifest with tumors on the outside, but they had them more on the inside of the body. Uh, and they grew inside the lymphatic vessel, some of the large ones uh, in this leg. And you could see that is lymph, that's edema. That's from not being able to drain the interstitium. And yep, you can see there's probably been a previous surgery right there as well. How about some more causes? Malignant tumors can grow. Cancer loves to travel through the lymph system, leukemias, lymphomas. That's why the lymphoma uh, comes from. And they can get stuck in the lymph nodes and they can grow there and they can block, knock that lymph node out of action and it can act like a beaver dam and you're going to swell upstream from that. Metastatic uh, disease, uh, maybe the cells, uh, let's see, oh, I guess I got these, I just explained metastatic disease, but leukemia can do it. You could get a tumor growing right next to a lymph vessel and it can pinch it as it gets bigger as well. It doesn't have to be growing inside the lumen. Here's a case. So here's a 73-year-old woman who had a, uh, you can see the left breast, and there's no right breast. And so she had a mastectomy, and a lot of the lymph nodes were infected, so they had to take out the lymph nodes, and they they couldn't connect them back together well. And on top of that, she had scarring from chemotherapy and radiation therapy in the region. And yeah, her, her hand is no tissue ischemia, tissue it's, it happens slowly so it's stretching things out but she has to wear like a compression stocking on this to stop this problem right but this is is this primary or secondary lymphedema well that'd be secondary right they used to this one works uh, it, it doesn't work anymore so it occurred after birth only milroy's disease is the primary lymphoma that you need to worry about Lymphangiitis, we talked about this in lab. So it's an acute inflammation of the lymph vessel, uh, typically secondary to a bacteria that is spreading down. It's got into the lymph system, and it's traveling kind of toward the, core, toward the core, traveling up from the, let's say your fingers get infected, it travels to the elbow and to the shoulder and into the axilla. Sometimes you can see these red streaks. Uh, and yeah, that's lymphedema, typically a bacterial infection, and I think uh, hemolytic, uh, beta hemolytic streptococci is one of the most common one of these things. And yeah, it, the key is it results in the classic streaks that I showed you in lab. In fact, there's one I haven't showed you this picture. There's lymphangiitis from an old bug bite. It's well healed now. But you can still see some of the residual inflammation. You can see the lymph nodes, how these lymph nodes, uh, or how the lymph system that got the infection in it. So the bugs once were in all these lymph vessels and an inflammation happened. Um, but he's pretty well healed. You can barely see the bug bite anymore. All right. Uh, so sometimes we can have trouble, though. Sometimes the, the bugs get out of the lymph system and they get into the the skin, just into the subcutaneous tissue, and they can start multiplying under there. And that is called cellulitis. It's very dangerous. It, um, you can have big pockets of bug pockets, and that's called an abscess. So we need to talk a little bit about this condition, cellulitis. You can see the antibiotics are working for this patient. There's the line. This redness was way up to here at once, and now it's backing off. But antibiotics, you, you get septicemia and die from this if you mess around with this. Um, so this is Bologna. This is a good, uh, really good dermatology book that goes into this as well. Nice evidence-based book. Uh, and, but it, cellulitis is an infection-driven inflammation. Uh, so it's a bug that gets into the dermis, into the deep dermis, and even gets can get down into the subcutaneous tissue uh, and hurt quite badly if it does. It has a classic skin presentation, erythema, swelling, warmth, and tenderness. Some of the eczematous lesions can have erythema, uh, but you're not going to have swelling and you're not going to have warmth. That's the difference between 
and eczema. Eczema is it can be erythemic, but it's usually crusty and itchy uh, and excoriated little little kind of scabs on it. We'll show you that when we get into dermatology. Um, but yeah, lymphangiitis and regional lymph node involvement may or may not, not occur, depending how uh, if this gets into the lymph system or not. And it could you could have cellulitis and you could get uh, an inf inflammation of the lymph vessels as well. So you could have a concomitant lymphangiitis in addition to the cellulitis. Maybe the cellulitis starts first from a wound, and it, then it causes lymphangiitis. Maybe lymphangiitis starts starts first and it causes the cellulitis because the bugs burl their way out of the or the inflammation burls its way out of the lymph vessels into the surrounding tissue if fevers and chills start that's a really bad sign it's probably starting to get into the blood that's not a good thing uh, but it can flu-like symptoms typically caused by group a streptococcus as i said or staph aureus that means the body's immune system is aware that it's there and it's fighting. It's trying to kill these things. Uh, what are the risk factors of developing cellulitis? Lymphedema, venous stasis, anytime the blood isn't moving uh, and it's starting to cause swelling, uh, alcoholism, leukemia, diabetes, PAD, we'll talk about peripheral arterial disease. But all of the following, they weaken the skin's barrier function as well. And the skin's barrier function, I mean, we need that because we have bugs around us all the time, right? And they try to get in through the skin and they can't because of our barrier function. But if our barrier breaks down, we'll talk about atopic dermatitis and that's exactly uh, what can happen in that situation. But don't want bugs getting down into the dermis. Why don't you want bugs getting down in the dermis? That's where the blood vessels are. That's where the lymph system is. It can get into the off to the races. It can become go out th spread throughout the body if it gets gets down that deep. Uh, abscess formation can occur, especially if it's the wicked MRSA, um, methylene resistant, um, methicillin resistant, Staphylococcus resistant bacteria, super bacteria that doesn't respond to antibiotics well. And yeah, it can cause tissue necrosis and hemorrhage. We'll look at some abscesses here in a minute, kind of gross. That's an emergency. That's the one step away from septicemia. So here's cellulitis in a diabetic. Why diabetic? How's the immune system of a diabetic? They're at risk, right, for COVID-19 right now because their immune systems don't work quite as well. And so this is a, <clears throat> this is a, an abscess that is pretty well healed. This one is not so well healed. They actually did surgery over here to it, and it's still got some pus in it. And Yeah, that's a cellulitis, all the red stuff. It's an inflammation of the skin and the dermis, and even the subcutaneous layer, and very serious. What's the treatment for cellulitis? 10-day course of antibiotics should hopefully do the trick. Um, you need to sa get the sample that though, right? You need to find out what type of bug is growing in there so you get the right antibiotic. Uh, they target the group A streptococci, staphylococci aureus uh, is the ones they target. Try to elevate the affected limb if possible uh, so the blood doesn't start to pool down there and increase the amount of ischemia. It's already going to swell because of the inflammation. It causes swelling anyway, so you don't need you don't need to have more swelling down there from being on your feet all the time with this. Wet bandage you can put on it. To avoid any painkillers, right? NSAIDs, acetaminophen, opioids. Uh, they don't. There's uh, Bologna made a big deal about this because if you're on painkillers, uh, one of the signs that it's gotten into the subcutaneous tissue where there's some big blood vessels there, you could get septicemia. Uh, if it starts becoming really painful, that's a really bad sign. So they don't want that masked. Uh, what about some lymph node complications? We said the red streaks. <clears throat> we talked about lymphangiitis. Uh, but the, the lymphangiitis can also be associated with some really big lymph nodes. And we looked at this in lab. Uh, but here, these are terms are again, they're so important for you to know. Lymph adenopathy, so lymph adenopathy is a node or a gland. 
<clears throat> so lymphadenopathy is an enlargement of a lymph node without any skin change or color change over the top. But if you get a lymph adenitis, that means that not only do you have an enlarged lymph node, but the inflammation has spilled out into the surrounding tissue, and you can visibly see erythema on top of the skin. Here's classic lymphangiitis. There's another one. I think I showed you these in lab. Some more lymphangiitis. Heading right into the axilla. There's another one. Really bad. They could lead to septicemia. Uh, here's a lymphadenopathy. We can see a nice big lymph node swollen up right there. Okay. Um, now, this wouldn't be lymphadenitis. How come? It'd have to be red, right? If the skin was all red around here on top of the lymph node, then you have obvious inflammation on the outside. Then that's some lymphadenitis. Uh, let's see, lymphadenitis, a bacterial infection, everything I said already, but not completely contained by the lymph nodes. Uh, inflammation is so severe gets into the adjacent skin. I could probably take these slides out. Uh, but it typically is associated with lymph, uh, lymphangiitis, not, um, not to be confused lymphangiitis with lymphadenitis. Lymphadenitis is an inflammation of redness over the skin over lymph node, and lymphangiitis are those streaks that we see. So here's some good example of a lymphadenitis. I think we saw this in the lab, but you can see the skin change in this uh, patient who had otitis externa, which is a infection, a bacterial infection of the external acoustic meatus. You can see the preauricular nodes and the posterior auricular nodes are both color changed. So. Uh, that's an example of lymphadenitis. There's one in a girl with a viral rep, uh, respiratory, upper respiratory tract infection. Uh, the tonsillar node is right at the angle, right? We studied these nodes already, submandibular nodes here. Uh, another sequelae. So this is the one we all fear. If the bacteria is not contained by the lymph nodes, it can get into the, where, where does, well, you tell me, where does the lymph system ultimately end up? It ultimately dumps where? Subclavian vein, right? And it gets into the lymph system. So what if all that bacteria gets dumps, dumped uh, dumped into the venous? Well, then it'll be everywhere. It'll be into, it'll go through the heart, it'll get pumped through the lungs, it, gets into the lungs first, and then it can start coming out of the lungs and getting to the arterial side and can get up to your brain, and that's really, really dangerous. Uh, so that's bacteremia and septicemia. We need to talk about those. Bacteremia means that a little bit of bacteria have gotten into the bloodstream. You may not even be symptomatic from this. And the spread usually comes from a lymph system, but it could enter the blood directly through an infection. It doesn't have to go through the lymph system. Patients are typically asymptomatic, but it could progress to deadly septicemia. And that is no joke. That's called blood poisoning. And you have bacteria flowing everywhere. It's stuck all over your veins and your arteries. And every place it's stuck, it burrows underneath the epithelium, and the body sees it and mounts an immune response against it. So you basically have an infection of your entire circulatory system. Tons of cytokines are being released, and cytokines just make the infection get worse and make the inflammation get worse and bring in the troops. And um, <clears throat> it's the cytokines that, that kill you. They're talking about COVID-19 and how the how a over kind of an overproduction of cytokine response occurs. And it's quite fascinating to scare this virus. This is a nasty virus. This uh, this guy. Anyway, I don't want to digress onto that. But uh, yeah, so cytokines, very powerful vasodilators. Uh, and so if you have a bunch of those flowing through your bloodstream, it's going to pop open your, all your blood vessels, and including all your little capillaries. And remember I said you can't have all your capillaries. We have meta arterials that turn those things off. Uh, meta, uh, um, 
or we have um, what are those called AV shunts, uh, AV anastomoses, uh, and the metaterials. And yeah, those things make it so we can't have we have we only have so much blood. We can't have all those capillaries open, or we'll die. There won't be enough blood volume. There won't be enough pressure, and that's what can happen. You go into hypovolemia. It should be hype. Um, Hypovolemic shock. Let me make a note to fix that. Slide 332, fix. Hypovolemic shock. Uh, and the blood pressure drops and you die. You, tissues, uh, you can't perfuse your tissues. Uh, so associated with significant morbid, morbidity mortality. So look at this one. 30% mortality rate with treatment in the hospital. You're in the hospital with this condition. As long as it has gotten your organs, you got about 66% chance or so uh, of staying alive or 70% chance of staying alive. If it gets into your organs and you get it going to septic shock uh, from all the cytokines overproduction and, and the bugs clog up your blood and make it really thick, 50-50 uh, chance you can, a hospital can save you. If you don't go to the hospital, you'll die for sure. So that's a medical emergency. Patient is very symptomatic at this stage with fever, tachycardia, hypotension, confusion, signs of hypovolemic shock, which I did spell it right there. You got to get a blood culture. You got to find out who the bu bug is so you can use the proper antibiotics. And you don't take antibiotics by mouth. These are intravenous. Even after you leave the hospital, you have a pick line put in, and you have to you have to put antibiotics right into your bloodstream. Um, so this is a very, very serious condition. Uh, if you are able to keep your blood pressure, uh, the bugs tend to get, they love to get into the lungs. That's the first place that they come in through the lymph system. They come in through the venous system. That's the first place they end up in your lungs so people can die of pneumonia, uh, septic shock, osteomyelitis. They can get into the bones. They can get into the liver and kidneys, and you can have all that shut down. You can get meningitis from it, can get into your central nervous system. Just a nasty, nasty disease. So let's stop talking about that. And now let's get to something peau de range, and let's talk about that. That's orange, right? Peau de range. Uh, so if this is seen, it's a breast cancer phenomenon. So if a patient has breast cancer, sometimes the cells get sucked up into the lymphatic system and they start causing little beaver dams. And the skin of the breast tissue starts to, it's upstream from the clog, you start to swell up the skin and your breast will start to swell and it'll start to become ischemic because of the swelling. It can start getting erythemic and you can start getting... Uh, ulcers and stuff uh, from this as well. This is a sign of breast cancer. You don't have to have a lump in your breast. You, you might not even feel any lump, but if it starts looking like an orange, uh, that's a really bad sign. So the immune system spots these cancer cells, and then a, a fibroblast heavy inflammation occurs, and it starts on top of the swelling, you start building up scar tissue deposits in the breast tissue. Just to, to show you how I mean, if we had, let's see, let's use blue here. So if the cancer, let's say the cancer started around the nipple here, all the cancer cells got in, uh, but they started causing beaver dams in all these lymph nodes that drain all this stuff. Um, so eventually the whole breast is going to start to, I can't draw all of that, but it's going to start to back up and we're going to get some skin changes and some uh, with this. So let's take a look at some of these here in a second. Well, not yet. So fibroblast is, is fibroblast heavy, or we said this, and it can, uh, on top of the swelling, you get these weird collagen deposits, and it can make the breast start to look like an orange uh, or really swell. Here's one that's really swollen up, and you can see all the, it's almost like a lichenification we'll talk about in dermatology. Uh, but a breast shouldn't look like that. And here it's becoming ischemic even. So some of the tissue is uh, dying and the body's uh, immune system is coming in to clean up the debris. And you got yourself a, a little bit of uh, color change here. And you can still, if you look closely, you can still see all the pores from all the swelling. It's all magnified. And then here's a classic uh, orange type appearance of someone who has uh, pretty severe breast cancer. 
and the the cancer is uh, started around the nipple, just like the, the story I drew. Her nipple starting to get retracted as well. Uh, so that's breast cancer, peau de range. All right, now let's change gears. Talk about a smoker's disease. This is called thromboangiitis obliterans. Right, it's also known as Berger's disease. I usually just call it Berger's disease, and it's an inflammation of the blood vessels, the arteries. Uh, but it likes the medium and the smaller arteries, like the tibial, the anterior and posterior tibial arteries, uh, peroneal arteries. Maybe the popliteal is about as big. Usually, it doesn't affect the popliteal, but it's got to be, and it doesn't affect the tiny little arteries either like the metatarsal arteries. It loves the, the posterior tibial, anterior tibial arteries. It likes that size. Same with your radius, uh, radial and ulnar arteries. It likes those size of arteries. Very strange. Uh, but it, it's related to smokiness, we'll see. It has nothing to do with atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis doesn't like arteries that small. It affects big arteries like your abdominal aorta is the, probably the number one spot for atherosclerosis. And then um, down to the common iliac arteries, the external iliac artery, your femoral artery maybe, but it'll never, atherosclerosis doesn't get down that low. The only weird thing with atherosclerosis, it loves the coronary and cerebral arteries. Those are special type. We, I cut all those slides out because I was getting too much histology and stuff, but those are, uh, they're smaller arteries medium-sized arteries, but they're special. They have special design, and uh, which makes atherosclerotic process more amenable in those areas. Um, but Berger's disease has nothing to do with atherosclerosis. And the theory is, because it's only seen in people who smoke heavily or chew heavily tobacco, uh, it's believed that some component in the, uh, the tobacco smoke gets into the bloodstream and circulates, and for whatever reason, that component sticks to the art, to the endothelial cells of these these medium-sized arteries, the posterior tibial artery, we'll say. And this component gets into the cell, into the epithelial cell, and somehow manipulates the genes and turns on genes that aren't supposed to be turned on. And if genes that are turned on in cells that aren't supposed to be turned on, your body might have trouble recognizing them as self. And if the body doesn't recognize them, they mark them for destruction and you get yourself a wicked inflammation process. So that's what we believe it's uh, from. Okay, so cigarette smoke turns on some genes, everything I just said, immune system attacks. Uh, and some some people call this endarteritis as well. You might hear that uh, for Berger's disease, inflammation of these medium-sized arteries. Um, but yeah, the inflammation stays chronic, even if they stop smoking. Sometimes it might help if the disease just started, but a lot of times it's too late to stop smoking uh, because once the genes are turned on, uh, the offspring of the genes, they divide by mitosis, of course, they'll stay on and the body will never recognize them and always fight them. So uh, everything I said again, chronic inflammation damages the endothelium, causes thickening and narrowing the inflammation process. I didn't say this, but it's intuitive. If you have an inflammation going on in the endothelial layer of your vessels, it's going to swell up and it's going to narrow the lumen, and therefore you're going to have a beaver dam. If it happens in your calf or uh, region where the posterior tibial is, uh, your foot is going to get cheated out of blood and your distal calf is going to get cheated out of blood. And that's the problem with this. Uh, so the first sign of it is when you go for a walk and you start using the muscles of your feet uh, and calf in your anterior compartment, Tom, Dick, and Harry there, uh, they need extra blood, right? You're walking. And because the arteries are beaver dammed, only so much blood can be given to them. And you start to get ischemic pain as you walk and your legs start feeling heavy and they hurt. And you have to stop walking. And if you stop walking, all of a sudden the the, the blood flow, or the, the oxygen deprivation is fixed by the blood that's flowing through there. And you can start walking again and then the same thing happens. 
That's called, there's Vic and Nick. Uh, Vic is vascular intermittent claudication. I do like, hint, hint, Vic and Nick. So you should know the difference between Vic and Nick. Visc, Vic is vascular intermittent claudication. Intermittent means it's just when you're going on a straight walk for a couple blocks. It doesn't usually happen walking around the house. Uh, although when it gets bad, it can. If you've been on your feet for like half the day. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, but the, the so the downstream ischemia causes claudication. Uh, and then pretty soon you don't even have to walk anymore. Just walking around the house will cause general pain in your feet or the, the part affected. And then pretty soon you start getting seeing erythema and there'll be some tissue necrosis and you start getting ulcers. And if you don't do anything about it, you end up getting gangrene and they're going to have to cut off your feet to save your life. So almost exclusively seen in cigarette smokers, as we said. Could be there's some cases it's been associated with chewing tobacco, uh, but th it's not a, this is not an old person's disease. It typically strikes about 35 years of old, a heavy male, uh, a male who smokes really heavily, Special, uh, especially uh, Middle Eastern, Asia, Mediterranean region. People who smoke a lot they, in those cultures, this disease is a lot more common. They have a lot more trouble. I think India, it's like 50%. Yeah, India, um, it's a little older research, but it used to be 50% there, uh, probably because of, they smoke a lot in that country. Prevalence is decreasing in the Western world, we think, because the rate of tobacco use is decreasing in the Western world. The estimated prevalence of this disease is 3%, so this is not like a little rare Marfan's type deal here. So we're going to talk about Raynaud's on Thursday, uh, but... The two are similar in a way, but they're not in a way. So unlike Raynaud's, this vessel narrowing, which is starting to cause pain, it's permanent. Uh, our Berger's disease is permanent. Raynaud's, you also get severe luminal narrowing from tunica media vasospasm. And, but that one is usually not permanent because after the, the attack passes, the vessels open up and you're okay. That's not always true, as we'll see when we talk about Raynaud's. Uh, so what's a differential diagnosis is these people are going to come into your office with a very common problem, central spinal stenosis. So these patients have NIC, neurogenic intermittent claudication, so VIC and NIC. Neurogenic means it's a problem with central spinal stenosis, all right, let's see if I can draw an overhead view. Oh, I have a picture coming up. I should probably. There's a vertebral body, an overhead view, pedicles. This is an axial view. Transverse processes coming out here. Lamina, pedicles, lamina. Okay, spinous process. All right, you know the view, right? So this is the vertebral canal. And you got your thecal sac here, right, or your dural sac. And then you have all the nerve roots making up the cauda hanging out here, just floating around in this gel. But you also have blood vessels here. And these are the epidural venous plexus. And there's some big blood vessels that drain uh, the nerves that come out. Um, then we have spinal nerves, right? We have the, oh, that's not a great color. But spinal nerves coming out of here, and these I should draw the drew these all yellow. Uh, but those guys, when you work and go for a walk, they make waste products, and it has to be they have to be drained away those waste products. Uh, but if you have if you have ligamentum flavum thickening like this, sometimes ligamentum flavum can look like this, and then you can have a disc bulge on top of that, and your pore little thecal sac is smashed into a little ball here so you go for a walk all these all these vessels are crushed so you can't you can't drain the nerves out of your extremities and you start to get the same pain when walking it's very similar kind of the anecdotal way to tell the difference people with the central stenosis their thecal sac being pinched uh, after a couple blocks or whenever the pain and weakness and heaviness comes on, uh, they have to stop walking and sit down and bend forward. You see these people walking around at Costco bent over a shopping cart. It's like actually called shopping cart sign. Uh, and they that opens up the 
the neural, the vertebral canal a little bit when you bend forward. Gives this a little breathing room. Uh, people with VIC, they just have to stop walking and rest the muscles, and they get better. That's the sensitivity and specificity is probably like in the 70%, so it's not the greatest in the world. But that's one way to kind of tell it apart. Uh, and so these people don't need low back pain. They don't have to have low back pain. A lot of times they don't. It's just the complaint of claudication. And it, what does it cause from in my little picture? Disc bulging and ligamentum flavum. And you can have a degenerative spondylolisthesis also can contribute to this. So well, but that's kind of getting beyond our scope here. Uh, let's see. Yep. So everything I talked about already. So here is a... Uh, Fit picture, and you can see the epidural venous plexus here. And they didn't draw the, the little capillaries, the lymph capillaries, but they drew just the big pipes. But uh, all those nerves, this is where the waste product is drawn from. But look at how big the vertebral canal is. And remember that the, right, there'd be a thecal sac in here. I'll draw it again, but yeah. And then all the nerve roots would be hanging out here kind of hanging out in the cerebral spinal fluid, life is good. Yeah. So now let's look at a MRI. Probably showed you some of this back in first quarter. Uh, but here's a, here's a cut. The spinous is back here. Here's the disc. And then here is the thecal sac. And you can see the nerve roots hanging out in the cerebral spinal fluid. These two right here are getting ready. Those are the uh, those are called the uh, traversing nerve roots. Uh, the level below these will, if this is L4, these will be L5 traversing roots. There's the dorsal root ganglia of L4. But yeah, there's plenty of room here, right? Everything's great. Ligamentum flavum isn't too thick. You can see that black line is ligamentum flavum. All right, now here's here's a cloud. I see these cases all the time. So here's somebody last year I saw couldn't walk more than two blocks, and there's the thecal sac. This is a T2 weighted. Compare that to this, where you can see all the white. Here it's smashed down. This is fat. That's epidural fat. All this black is thickening of ligamentum flavum. And partial because we have a disc has collapsed a little bit and it buckled a little bit. Uh, but ligamentum flavum, like the prostate, can just grow in size and we don't know what the deal is with that. Right? And they got a little slip starting as well, they get a little degenerative spondy starting the inferior articular process has slipped forward a little bit here. But anyway, I don't want to get too deep into that, but that's the cause. Uh, but that has to be the differential diagnosis is VIC, vascular intermittent neurogenic claudication. All right. Um, another strong differential diagnosis is PAD, peripheral artery disease, is really the same thing, only the bigger pipes are clogged up. Uh, so pad, the external iliacs might be clogged up with atherosclerotic plaque, and you got a huge beaver dam. These paper people are going to have hypertension too. The heart's going to have to muscle up to get through that. The heart will muscle up a little bit to get through the, like the posterior tibial artery, but it doesn't have to muscle up as much to get through this. Uh, but anyway, so yeah, stenosis can cause reduced, decreased arterial blood flow. And that can also reduce intermittent claudication. Right? So how do you tell another way to tell the two? Well, with, uh, with uh, Berger's disease, there, when you go to test correctly, that person is correctly testing the dorsalis pedis, uh, and when you go try to test the posterior tibial, uh, there won't be any pulses there and these thromboangitis people, either one of them. You should be able to get one of them. You can get your little Doppler ultrasound and try that as well. Uh, but, yeah. And, but then when you go up to get the popliteal, like we did in our, was that last week? Showed you how to do that. Uh, you'll feel a pounding pulse. So that's not a good sign, right? Uh, so you always, you when you take pulse, if you feel a dead pulse here, don't just stop. Somebody told me that. Well, they told us that you don't have to, if you find a uh, diminished pulse here, you're done with the, the pulse exam. That's ridiculous uh, because we can tell if it's burgers uh, versus pad by going up higher. Uh, so if the, if the patient has pad and the beaver dam is way up in the, 
the femoral arteries, the popliteal pulse will be there. It's usually up even higher in the external iliac. The femoral pulse, the common femoral pulse, will be there as well. Uh, so check all those pulses. People with burgers, it's usually they have an absent uh, dorsalis pedis and posterior tibial. That's the norm for someone with burgers disease. But there's something even better, a better test you can do for this. Although this test won't differentiate between burgers and pad. Uh, it'll just tell you if the pipes are clogged. And this is called the ankle brachial index. I took this out and then it's such a popular test I brought it back in a couple quarters ago. And we got to talk about it. Uh, so this is the ABI test. You can you can do this in your office if you have a little Doppler ultrasound uh, and a stethoscope and a and a arm cuff, right? Which you do. So and you can build for it as well. And you could it's it's a great test. It's incredible sensitivity and specificity for this test. Uh, so you can use it to see if the arteries are clogged. They have. If, the, if they are, the patient has PAD or Burgers disease. Most likely PAD. Burgers is much more rare in our country compared to PAD. But their pipes are clogged. So ABI is achieved by finding systole, or the cutoff pressures, of three arteries. The brachial artery. If you can't find a brachial, you can do the radial. That's fine. But most of the time, if you do the correct technique, you should be able to find the brachial artery. And then you take dorsalis pedis in the posterior. And you're going to take whichever arm is highest. If your right arm is 5 or 10 higher, you're going to use that throughout all the testing. And then for each leg or each foot, whichever one is higher, you will use that one against this one. Okay, uh, But it's simply the ankle systole divided by the, branch, uh, the brachial artery systole. And that's your brachial artery index. Uh, here's someone who obviously is going to have a positive ankle brachial index test. You can see all the uh, problems he has. Uh, but you take they're taking the dorsalis pedis, not with its fingers, but with a Doppler ultrasound. And, yeah, and they this is all automated. So they have a machine that does this. But you could do this with a blood pressure cuff just as well. You can physically pump it up and watch where the pulse disappears. And the pulse is like almost a heartbeat, like a thud, 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 thud. And when you pump it up and it disappears, that's your systole. And you can go 30 up and come down and double check it that way, make sure there's not an oscillatory gap. But get that systolic number, uh, and then you've already done the artery, and you got yourself the break, you've got yourself the ABI number. And then do the same with the other. And it's pretty simple. And then plug into this formula. So it's the ankle pressure over the highest arm pressure, whether it be right or left. You always use this as the same pressure. Um, but the right ankle pressure, is it the posterior tibial or is it the dorsalis pedis? You use whichever one's higher. Then you go over to here on the left. Is it dorsalis pedis uh, or is it posterior tibial? Whichever's higher, you plug in here. And then you got yourself a, an ABI number. And for example, here's common finding and someone was starting to have some claudication. Their, their dorsalis pedis was 110 millimeters of mercury and their brachial pressure was 120, their systole, which is normal. And that, you do the math, you come out with 0.92 and that's borderline. That's getting, getting close. Anything, once you hit 0 0.90 or go below that to 0.8, uh, you got yourself, you got yourself a beaver dam somewhere. It's probably pad, but it could be burgers if you're a heavy smoker. So here's the official results. So an ABI uh, that is 0.9 or lower, so 0.89 would be uh, 0.87, etc., uh, makes the diagnosis of peripheral artery disease until proven otherwise. Might be might be burgers disease, but unlikely. This is way more common. Uh, now what if it's a, one leg is good and the other one is terrible? Maybe it's a 0 0.7. What does that mean? Well, you got a beaver dam and it may not be, it's probably not peripheral artery disease because that usually affects the big pipes and you'll have bilateral symptoms. Maybe you just have a tumor. Maybe you have an arterial blood clot. Maybe there's a tumor pushing and squeezing the femoral artery, so you get a down, the downstream flow is terrible. So unilateral has to be investigated. 
So having a positive ABI number under 0.9 is also significantly associated with a higher mortality rate from all sorts of cardiovascular diseases. So what's your job if you discover uh, anybody down in this area? You refer to a vascular surgeon. I always ask that question. A lot of people don't know who do you refer to your family doctor or the, the primary doc. No, they won't probably know what to do with them or they'll know what to do with them. Uh, but you, you're a primary doc, so you refer them to a vascular surgeon. What about these borderline between 9 and 1? Uh, they probably have some early atherosclerotic placking, and there is a little beaver dam starting. Uh, so it's good you could refer them as well for to a uh, vascular surgeon to check out just to get a baseline and because uh, they'll probably be seen another 10 years they'll probably be back with that vascular surgeon with problems uh, but again the increased cardiovascular events are quite prevalent in this group now look at these numbers you don't see this very much with hands-on tests uh, so ABI is really accurate. So angiography, of course, if you really want to know if there's a beaver dam, you squirt some contrast into their artery, and then you watch it on fluoroscopy and see if it if it makes it all the way through. If the vessel's pinched, the, the dye won't go through. The contrast won't go through. So that's the gold standard, but that's, I mean, there's radiation involved in that from the fluoroscopy. Uh, so why do that? Uh, and in fact, Stanford, I know, because I've had this tested myself at Stanford, uh, and they don't do angiography. If your ABI is positive, then they'll do angiography to see where the beaver dam is. Uh, but sensitivity and specificity, look at that, 97 to 100% on both of those. That's a fantastic, uh, fantastically accurate test, and it's something you can do in your office. Okay, and the has very high intra and interrater reliability as well. So what more could you ask for? Great test. All right, we're almost done with this. So clinical features of burgers or thromboangiitis obliterans. Claudication, we talked all about that. Um, claudication pain, they go for a walk. As things get worse, pretty soon just walking around the house or maybe just sitting around, they're starting to get throbbing pain from doing hardly anything. And then you'll start to get some ulceration in the digits, which get the worst blood supply. Uh, and patients who quit, they refuse to quit smoking and they just ignore this, take pain pills, they can get gangrene and it can lead to an amputation. Sorry, I can't warn you. I can't see the slides coming like when I'm in lecturing in school. I can see the slides coming so I can warn you. But yeah, this is gangrene. A uh, patient's going to lose half of their foot because of this, and it's Berger's disease, and the patient never quit smoking. Uh, let's see, clinical testing. Well, there's a test called, guess what, Berger's test, and we'll learn that in lab. I'll show you how to do that. And um, there's, it's a two-part test. Basically, I'll explain it. You just lay the patient face up on a table, and you, do, you lift both of their legs up to about 60 degrees. And the authors are all over the place. This test is described so many different ways. So I, 60 degrees, some say 90, some say 45, some say 30. I like 60 degrees because you observe the feet for 60 seconds. So 60, 60. And you watch the bottoms of their feet and see what color they turn. And normally your feet aren't going to turn like Casper the Ghost. I don't even know if you guys know who Casper the Ghost is, but that's a ghost who's super white. Now, they shouldn't do that. That's pallor. And that's an indication that just the simple force of gravity is stopping the blood flow from getting to the feet. That's not good. Uh, they have either peripheral artery disease or Berger's disease. Uh, and then to confirm that, you swing the patient up, set them up right after this test, and you watch the return of color in their feet. Normally, most of uh, you, when you do this test, everybody's feet, when you put your feet up at 60 degrees for a minute, they lose a little bit of color. When you whip them down in a position of dependence, that's a key word, position of dependence, meaning their gravity is pushing down on them. Um, when, you, when you set them up, their feet come back to color you know, five seconds, 10 seconds or so. People with clogged pipes, Berger's disease, or with pad, they don't feel, they could take 20, 30, 40 seconds. And sometimes there's a phenomenon called dusky red, uh, where all the, and I'll explain that when I get to lab, but all the 
nitric oxide that was generated when the patient's feet were straight up, all that nitric oxide slid down to the popliteal area because of gravity. But when you set them up, all those factors come rushing down into the feet, albeit slowly, and it over vasodilates and their feet turn like a rock lobster. Okay, what about the treatment for Berger's disease? Well, if you stop, completely stop tobacco, it may slow down or maybe even halt the process. You have to stop smoking uh, during the claudication phase. If it gets past the claudication phase where it starts hurting you just walking around the house, it's SOL. Uh, you might as well not even, not, well, you should. there's other reasons you should stop smoking, uh, but it doesn't have much effect. If it gets bad, they can try to open your blood vessels by cutting the sympathetic nerves. Remember, sympathetics are always vasoconstricting the vessels. So you can do something called a sympathectomy. And that is, that's the only treatment really for it, other than cutting off your feet. And that, uh, they do that in the lumbar spine. We actually, on the cadavers, we actually saw the sympathetic chain. They just snipped that chain. And then that'll vasodilate all the blood vessels of your lower extremity. So your feet might be happy, but your thighs will be hot and sweaty. Uh, and you'll have, you've lost, without sympathetics, you lose your ability to sweat. So probably won't be a problem that someone this who has this problem. But uh, if they're exercising and it's hot out, they could get, be careful with heat stroke because they can't sweat like they're supposed to. So there is some negative sequelae from that. Uh, and then we got to be careful between... Raynaud's phenomenon. I mean, this looks like an attack of Raynaud's, which we'll talk about next time, but it's not Raynaud's because we can see they got some tissue damage here. So this has been going on for a while. Uh, so this is actually, they don't, this is not an attack. This is the way they are all the time. Um, they have Berger's disease uh, in both radial and ulnar arteries. And so they don't have good circulation. Um, if you did that, um, that capillary refill test, it would be really, really slow on, the, on these people. All right, peripheral artery disease, I think we'll stop it right there, and I will see you on Thursday. Bye-bye.